Hello, everyone. Um, I'm delighted to welcome you to today's um, virtual roundtable organized by GBC Health Corporate Alliance of Malaria in Africa, Kama. I would like to thank our distinguished um, speakers and participants for joining us today. I'm Ochuko Keyamo Onyige, I'm the director of Kama. Kama is a unique coalition of companies from various industries working together to drive impacts and end malaria in Africa. We do this in part by creating platforms like this to learn from each other, to share experiences, and to collaborate on solutions that generate tangible results and impacts. Today's event is themed seven years to achieve the global technical strategy. What needs to change? There is no better time than now to ask this question, especially in the light of the current challenges we are faced with in the fight against malaria. Great strides have been made in tackling malaria in Africa, but in recent years, progress has stalled. Malaria elimination programs face challenge, challenges after challenges, from weak health systems to flattened funding to climate change to rising biological threats. However, these challenges provide an opportunity for, for us to think differently in what needs, what is needed to accelerate progress um, in countries' um, goals towards attaining the global technical strategy for malaria, which um, aims to reduce malaria morbidities and mortalities by, by 90% by, by 2030. This discussion, therefore, is very crucial during the lead up to the World Malaria Day. The meeting will provide a forum for thought leaders to acknowledge where progress has, has been made and what we need to identify what needs to change and explore how to make change happen. Your insights and lessons learned are needed now more than ever. But before I introduce our, our panelists, I would like to say a big thank you once again to the audience and for joining us from across the globe. Um, we'll have time for audience Q&A in the course of the meeting. Uh, please provide your comments and questions via the Q&A chat box. Your contributions are most welcome. The session will be recorded and the link will be shared with all participants post the event. So uh, moving forward, I would like to welcome Janice Davis Streets. She's the manager of Global Public Health and Special Projects and also co-chair for Kama um, for a welcome remark. Over to you, Janice. Thank you, Ochuko. Thank you, Kama, today's esteemed speakers, and thank you all for joining us today as we approach World Malaria Day. This day once again brings us together and provides the opportunity to connect around identifying and implementing solutions that will move us closer to with the global technical strategy goals and targets, and ultimately to more successful elimination of malaria. As Ujuko mentioned, there has been mixed progress towards achieving the GTS goals, especially against the backdrop of a devastating pandemic. Regardless, we have learned so much and we have seen pockets of success, and I think we should celebrate that. And as we learn, we need to continue to refine, shift, and adapt plans and efforts for the realities of the world we're living in, our ever-changing environment, and our respective technological, pharmaceutical, political, and business climates. We will hear much more about this from our panelists, but as I reflect on malaria and other health threats, I can't help but be reminded of the similarities in what we need to do and do better, like enhanced surveillance, integrated health systems, and strengthening country-led capacity. And we need to continue to do this together. At Chevron, we've been combating the impacts of malaria for over 100 years in our operations. We focus on health protection and prevention, not only for our workforce, but also for the communities where we operate. We have proudly partnered with many of you, and especially with Kama, and these partnerships have been and continue to be critical for our shared success towards the GTS goals, but more importantly, towards saving lives and improving community prosperity. The lessons of these past decades is that we are better together. Now, please join me as we hear from leaders in advancing malaria elimination and building stronger and more effective systems and solutions. And as you listen, I would encourage each of us to look inward and ask ourselves and our organizations, what can we do to support these efforts? Thank you. Thank you, Janice, um, for that beautiful remark. 
So now we will turn um, to, to the panel um, of today's discussion. Joining me on this panel includes five amazing speakers. We have Dr. Corinne Karema, who is the interim CEO, CEO of RBM Partnerships to End Malaria. She has over two decades of malaria control elimination experience, including serving as a director of the Rwanda NMCP. She recently served as a special advisor to the board chair of the Global Fund. We have Satish Sherukumali. <laughs> Um, he is the Chief Executive Officer of Track It Now. He is an entrepreneur with over two decades of experience in business, operations, and information technology. His current focus is to use technology to provide solutions in public health and public safety, which can add value to millions of people around the world. We have Dr. Pepeshua Uhumobi. She is a National Coordinator, National Malaria Elimination Program, Nigeria. She has over a decade of malaria program implementation in Nigeria. Before her current role, she served as a director in charge of surveillance, monitoring, and evaluation at the Federal Ministry of Health, Nigeria. We have Avery Avri Katos. She's the acting deputy malaria division chief, US, um, USAID president, um, US President Malaria Initiative. She's a health science specialist in the Bureau for Global Health at USAID, and she currently co-leads the social and behavior change interagency technical team for the US President Malaria Initiative. And she's also currently acting as a deputy malaria De division chief. And we have Patrick Sears, is the head of global growth, public health Vestigard. Patrick is an international sales and advocacy executive with over 20 years experience in Africa, Middle East, Asia, and Europe. He currently oversees Vestigard's public health vector control sales of the new permanent WHO pre-qualified long-lasting bed nets throughout the whole of Africa. Once again, thank you for joining us. So now we will dive right into the discussion, the meat of today's meeting. And my first question will go to Dr. Corin. Dr. Corin, what are the current challenges working against the achieving the GTS goals? And how can we overcome these challenges? Over to you, Dr. Corin. Yeah, thank you, Oshuko. And thank you very much for Kama and then the GBSC Health to organize this uh, important event. So I really want to thank you for inviting me on behalf of the RBM partnership to end malaria and also take this opportunity to commend and appreciate your commitment as well as engagement in the fight against malaria. And of course, as you know, uh, the private sector has a big role in the fight against malaria, not only uh, when we look at Africa providing uh, all the malaria services, treatments, uh, they are also part of the development of new tools that are really needed to, to, to end malaria. And I also thank you for organizing this event ahead of the World Malaria Day as we come together to celebrate and then also alight uh, the need uh, for urgent action and further investment uh, to end uh, malaria. So maybe before I go to the challenges, I think it's really very important to say that uh, for the last two decades, the massive uh, scale up of malaria intervention, as well as the increased uh, funding, uh, political will, as well as strong partnership has enabled the, 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 the world to, to really make progress against malaria since, 20, uh, since 2000. And we have seen that uh, this has contributed to nearly uh, saving uh, 2 billion cases, averting 2 billion of cases, and also averting, uh, uh, preventing 12 million uh, uh, deaths. And of course, uh, as you, 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 you have just uh, saying, we are, not, uh, we, we are not on track in regards to the uh, global uh, technical strategy uh, milestone as well as goal. So uh, for the last maybe uh, recent years, the five years, uh, evidence had emerged that the overall progress against malaria made uh, in the first 15 years uh, was beginning to stall. 
and especially in uh, moderate and uh, high uh, malaria uh, transmission countries. And then, of course, uh, the situation has also been made worse by the COVID-19 pandemic. And then, of course, this despite of the best effort that countries and partners have done to adverse, um, advert the world uh, case scenario. And uh, as a result, uh, when you look at the data uh, estimated by the World Malaria Report uh, for last year, uh, there were 241 million cases and 619,000 uh, malaria deaths. And this making us off track uh, by uh, nearly 48% for both malaria case, malaria case in incidents as well as mortality rate uh, relative to where we were expecting to be based on the um, GTS uh, milestone. So uh, in regard of the challenges, there are many challenges and maybe I will just uh, point uh, the four or five men. So the first one is the low coverage of existing malaria intervention. And uh, of course, when I, I, I say low coverage, it's more in terms of quality, uh, an issue of access that may be linked to, for instance, access to primary health care or inadequate uh, delivery services, as well as limited uh, funding. So, for instance, when I, I take just an example of um, when you look at uh, with the data of the World Malaria Report uh, of last year, 80% of deaths were due to malaria. They were uh, among children under five. And uh, when we look at in terms of access, uh, about of 70% um, of children who are, who are having fever, only 40% are really properly di diagnosed. So this is really showing an issue of uh, low coverage of the existing uh, tools. And then, uh, of course, there is also poverty. When you look at, for instance, children who are from po the poorest household are five times more likely to be infected. And then also to also uh, likely uh, not having access to, to the treatment or diagnostic uh, when they have a fever. So the second issue that we are having also, there is a growing threat of insecticides and anti-malaria uh, uh, resistance and uh, those are really the biological traits uh, that have threatened malaria control and elimination effort and that really are putting uh, progress at risk. So for instance when when you look at the ability of the Anopheles mosquito and the malaria parasite uh, to transmit, uh, they, they really constantly uh, evolve and uh, they, 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 they have given rise to emerging drug and insecticide resistance. And then, of course, this has an impact in reducing the efficacy of the existing uh, tools. The third one, uh, which is also one of the most important, is there is shortfall uh, in global malaria funding. So for instance, when you look at between uh, 2021 to 2023, uh, the global globally funding for malaria uh, control has fallen by uh, 4.8 billion uh, US dollars. So for instance, for the estimated roughly 8 billion US dollars that we need every year, uh, for us to eliminate malaria and be on track as estimated by the GTS, we, are, we have less than 50% of the funding uh, needed. Uh, and this is uh, also an issue. And this also, this in addition, for instance, of all the out-of-pocket out expenditure that are really affecting and impacting uh, families uh, for uh, seeking healthcare and also uh, malaria services. And then maybe the last one that I think it's really important and it's the COVID. You know that we had significant disruption of essential uh, malaria services due to COVID. And then we also have countries that uh, are, have humanitarian emergencies. So these also are also impacting uh, and uh, one of the main challenges um, for malaria. So uh, for us, how the you know the second question is how can we overcome those challenges? So first of all, it's important to note that malaria is a preventable and treatable disease. So 
First of all, it's not acceptable. It's not acceptable to still have death due to malaria. Today, we are having a child dying from malaria every minute. This is not acceptable. And this is the sense of what we, we are calling for this World Malaria Day. So country leaders, private sector donors, and all partners must urgently step up the effort to get the fight against malaria back on track. And that's why for this here team, we, re we choose to invest, innovate, implement, and really it's time for us to deliver uh, zero uh, malaria. So uh, for us to overcome uh, the challenges, so the first one is uh, we need to use the current tools uh, that we have efficiently. So country, we have seen that there are many countries that have, have eliminated malaria, and you have seen that we are also having two countries that um, have been uh, eliminating malaria this year. So it's really showing that using the current tools uh, and uh, avail the available kind of tools, it's possible to eliminate malaria. So this is number one. Number two, it's important that we implement the new tools in the pipeline. Uh, we have seen that for the recent research and um, development investment, they've produced uh, the most robust pipeline for malaria intervention over a decade. So we are having long lasting, it's good that we have a uh, vest guard uh, with us on this panel. We have new nets and it's really important that we deploy, we scale up uh, the, the distribution of all the malaria, the new tools that are being uh, developed so that we can also help to end malaria. And then of course, it's also important that we support innovative research to create even more new uh, tools, new treatments, new uh, preventive uh, measure. And then, of course, uh, this is what we do as uh, the RBM partnership to hand malaria, to continue to keep malaria high on the global health and political agenda. So try to see how we can use all voices, political capital, as well as funding to keep uh, that focus and accelerate also all the efforts uh, to, to, to end malaria. And then, of course, uh, importantly, it's important to increase investment uh, in, in malaria. So when I say increase invest in, investment in malaria, it's first of all to do more with less money. So it's really important that uh, we, we, we have efficiencies uh, in using uh, in the use of both domestic and external funding. It's also important that uh, there is increase of donor and domestic funding. As you saw, for instance, last year, we had the global fund replenishment that had the target of 18 uh, billion US dollar, but so far it's only 15.7 um, uh, billion that was realized. So it's really, uh, important that we try to look at in other innovative funding as well as uh, domestic funding that can also be uh, improved and increased to, to fill the gap. And then of course, it's also important maybe to also see how we can increase synergies. Uh, so for instance, uh, when you look at the COVID-19, have shown that uh, the fragility of the health system uh, can affect also uh, the disruption as well as uh, the malaria uh, services. So it's really important that when we look at uh, the funding, it's also important to also think of uh, investing and strengthening the, the, the health system uh, component. And uh, basically for me, those are the most and uh, the key elements that will help us to overcome uh, the challenges. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Corinne, um, for giving us uh, a true picture of where we are uh, as a global malaria community and what we need to do to actually um, progress, move progress to achieving our goals. Um, thank you. Um, all to our next speaker, I'm Dr. Perpetual. And similar, um, similarly, what I've already, a um, question I posed to Dr. Corinne, would like to hear from you from a country perspective. And what yeah. has worked, and what hasn't worked, especially in Nigeria, we know the importance of Nigeria in, um, in, in malaria control elimination. We know how important Nigeria is. So one, we hear from you, yeah. what has worked and what hasn't worked and what can we do differently to achieve the goals of the GTS, especially as it regards to Nigeria? Okay, thank you very much, uh, Ochuko, for this uh, opportunity. 
um, for inviting me to be part of this panel on this very timely and topical issue, particularly as we are approaching the World Malaria Day celebration. In terms of Nigeria, of course, we all know that Nigeria bears the highest burden for malaria in terms of cases and deaths annually. The last uh, World Malaria report, we saw that Nigeria uh, was responsible for about 27% uh, 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 of cases globally and 32% of deaths that was recorded in 2021, making us the highest burden country. So uh, what is the implication of this? This means that uh, you know about a, a third of, of the population, global population of children and adults dying from malaria come from Nigeria. And similarly, about over a quarter of cases are recorded from Nigeria. So what have we done in terms of, uh, well, first of all, what are some of the challenges that we have seen over the years in terms of malaria implementation in Nigeria? Largely, uh, primarily, we see the issue of funding, lack of sufficient funding to have optimal coverage of malaria intervention across the different intervention, whether it's terms of prevention, case management, surveillance, m, m and &E, uh, procurement, and all that to achieve 80%, which is what is articulated in our strategic plan. We've not been able to optimize our intervention because of lack of funding. So for the past uh, five years or more, about a third of the country in terms of the states have not had any major donor funding. So they've not had any I, uh, ITN campaign the past five to six years. They've not had uh, uh, sufficient commodities in the health facility for uh, diagnosis and treatment, and so on and so forth. So we see that we have a lot of gap in, in terms of funding. Another major challenge, of course, has, has been the issue around um, the emerging, just like uh, Dr. Corinne said, we are all, we're also experiencing the issue of emerging insecticide uh, resistant uh, you know, uh, uh, issue in the country. It's also a problem because we have seen widespread uh, resistance of hydroid insecticide in the nets that are being deployed. So it means that we are, we now have a need to adopt the new tools, the new ITNs, the next generation and the PBO nets. But then that also means it has funding implication uh, for the program. So even within our strategic plan, what we had budgeted, now we now have to change some of those ITNs to next generation nets and the PBO nets means additional funds, which is not available. So you find that almost across the country, there's widespread insecticide uh, resistance to pyrethroids. Another challenge, of course, you mentioned the issue of, of COVID, which have affected the, the, the whole uh, uh, world, not just Nigeria, but we also saw that that also um, affected the program, some of the indicators we had. But uh, uh, fortunately for us, we, we, we responded to, to that COVID uh, pandemic by developing a mitigation uh, plan to, to quickly ensure that we do not uh, step, step down our intervention. So in spite of the COVID pandemic, we continue to roll out our ITN and SMC uh, campaign. And incidentally, during the COVID, we actually scaled up uh, seasonal malaria chemo prevention from nine states in the Sahel Island to 21 states by 2020. So we, because we did that from the subnational tailoring and certification that we did in the program. So even in spite of the COVID, we just had to change the strategy uh, for reaching these children with both and then the reaching households with next critical intervention that were needed. So the impact of the COVID was not so, so high because of this uh, purposeful effort for us to make sure that we do not um, lose the momentum because of the COVID. Another challenge that we have, of course, we know that the country has been faced with uh, continued insurgency and insecurity, which has affected uh, a lot of uh, population, resulting in uh, increasing uh, internet displayed uh, 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 populations across the country and also that vulnerable population with unmet needs for malaria intervention in particular. And of course, we also experienced uh, flooding, massive flooding in the last two years, which has also affected the uh, case of malaria in the country. And uh, these are uh, the, having commodities to be able to meet this uh, po vulnerable population had also be a challenge for us in the country. But in spite of this, some of these challenges, we know, of course, we, we continue to have issues around the poor funding for malaria research to, in, to, to inform policy changes and decision, a programmatic decision, and of course, the issue around poor data quality. But in spite of this, the country 
uh, it's operating in, in, in a national malaria strategic plan that was actually derived from a, a very robust uh, mal a malaria program review and then this uh, stratification and subnational tailoring. So, which is one of the reasons, like I mentioned earlier, why we had to scale up uh, seasonal malaria prevention using granular data at local, local government level to identify the eligible local governments that were, were uh, uh, um, that were to benefit from this seasonal malaria chemo prevention in children under five. So we've continued that scale up uh, for the last two, two years to 21. To, so by, by 2022, we actually reached about uh, 27 million plus children, targeted children with seasonal malaria chemo prevention in four cycles uh, last year. And we hope to do the same this year with funding, of course, from our partners. But beyond that, we know we had a paucity of uh, funding in which about a third of the country didn't have any major uh, funding. So those are some of the issues. But we adopted the, uh, the WHO high, high body, high impact approach as part of this current uh, strategy plan to help us to refocus on, uh, our strategies and also accelerate progress in terms of achieving impact. And, and the effort of that, uh, adoption of the high body high impact is, is what led to some of this uh, subnational tailoring that we have done and the uh, other intervention that we scaled up. Increasingly now we are using more and more of these uh, insecticide resistant monitoring data to inform the kind of nets that we're deploying across the state. We're not, we're hardly using territory nets. Only one state or so one or two states in the whole country now that's still where we, are, we have a, a, a still a, a efficacy to the pyritory net that we are still deploying. Other, otherwise, all the other states are now using either PBO nets or, or the uh, dual active ingredients net for, for intervention. But then again, we've also had the issue around not being able to, you know, the, relying only on ITN massively for, for prevention. We're not able to implement indoor residual spray because of lack of funding. Which, which would have complemented um, ITN use, because we know that there's a disparity between the coverage and use of ITN, because ITN is largely uh, human behavior uh, uh, related. So even if you give them nets and they're not using it, you're not going to get the impact. So we know that there's a low net uh, use culture in the country. And uh, so we need to scale up uh, uh, SBC's uh, 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 social behavioral change conversation. But of course, we also know that SBC funding is also one of those that get affected when there's paucity of funds. It's also one of those that get the least funded, I think. Yet it's important to have that, to be able to make sure that the nets that are being sold, uh, distributed are being used by the population. But then you have IRS that is not uh, being funded at all in the country, which is not human behavior dependent. And if, if you were able to, to complement the net with uh, indoor residual spraying in some targeted area where we continue to have persistence of uh, uh, malaria transmission, I'm sure that we would have made more progress than we have. Not, not to say that the program is not making progress. We have uh, gradually reduced our, our, our national prevalence in children under five from 42% in 2010 to 22% in 2021 in the last malaria indicator survey. So we are making progress. But not, not of course, uh, we not we are not on track like uh, most of the other countries across Africa uh, along the GTS strategy. But uh, we are making uh, progress. But if we had like, if we're able to address all these challenges that I said programmatically and uh, you know get more funding support both from government and from our donor partners, I'm sure that we will be able to make more progress. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pepe Shual. Thank you so much. Um, I'm happy you mentioned the bright spots. Um, it's not all gloomy. Uh, we have some bright spots and progress have been made despite the challenges that we have in, in, in the fight against malaria. And the, the, the idea or the, what we're having this conversation is to enable us to understand what, what, what is working so we can build on those things. And I'm happy that you mentioned a few of them. And um, we have a number of people on the line and stakeholders, and I'm sure they, they, they are listening uh, in addition to um, governor, um, government and donor funding, the private sector has a huge role to play as well. And uh, we have a number of them on the line. And, and I'm, I'm hoping that with this conversation, we'll be able to garner more support and you know, commitment in the fight against malaria. Thank you so much for, for that um, uh, um, beautiful remark. And so I'll move on to our next speaker, um, um, Satish. <laughs> Satish, I'm coming to you. And uh, we've had so much about, talk, talked about 
the challenges we are having. But the good thing is there are solutions. And one of them is innovation. And that's where you come in. So can you talk about, tell us of the role of the Internet of Things and innovation in achieving the GTS? Sure. Um, yeah, and what is the prospect of the smart mosquito control management solution in achieving the GTS goal? Please, let's stick to our five minutes. Thank you. Thanks. Sure. All Thank right. you. All right. Okay. Um, so, so good day to you all. Uh, thanks to GBC Health and Kama team for organizing this event. So, as listed in the GTS report, there are several challenges for uh, successful malaria control programs like lack of lack of vector and disease surveillance, pesticide resistance, drug resistance, lack of understanding on disease transmission paths, ability to monitor the progress of interventions. On top of these challenges, Strategic Alliance Group on Malaria er Eradication considers climate change land use change and human migration as mega trends that will influence the future progress. GTS launched the high burden, high impact initiative which moves away from one size fits all strategy to interventions tailored to local settings. GTS further recommends Im improving impact using data to stratify and tailor malaria interventions to the local context. Several disease influencing factors that includes vector ecology, climate, environment, and human population makes it complicated and it is very challenging to collect real-time data. Consistently, that can help to improve effective interventions. Fortunately, innovations in deep technologies like artificial intelligence, sensors, and satellite images helped in building the Mosquito platform, which collects real-time data autonomously. Mosquito is a data platform which leverages artificial intelligence and sensors, meaning Internet of Things, to prevent mosquito-born diseases in high burden communities. Using real-time mosquito and disease surveillance data, interventions data, climate, population, mobility, and environmental data. Current vector and disease surveillance approaches are manual and not real-time, which leads to inefficient mosquito and disease control operations. The lack of skilled entomologists is a roadblock to collecting real-time data. Muscat deploys a network of sensors across rural and urban areas to identify where problems exist, the efficacy of interventions, and when to reapply. Muscat sensors uses sensors use novel AI algorithms to classify mosquitoes and identify pathogens. Sensors are easy to ship, install, and operate works with inconsistent networks and transfers data to the cloud. Muscate provides customizable web reports and mobile applications. It predicts the outbreak of the diseases, which helps in prioritizing the intervention operations. Muscate's data platform approach using AI and sensors to collect data at this scale is not used so far. Additional critical data points like infections, breeding points, weather, human population data, uh, uh, density, and socioeconomic level of the population are also collected. This data determines where and when interventions are required. Intervention recommendations are provided based on the local context. Efficacy of the interventions are also analyzed in real time. This helps to increase the coverage by improving the effectiveness of the interventions and align with the high burden, high impact strategy initiated by GTS. Actual vector interventions are entered in the platform and this helps to analyze the pesticide resistance, which is a major problem. GTS highlights the importance of community engagement. Once again, Muscat uses technology, that is the mobile app for community engagement and crowdsourcing of data. Community app is used for distributing awareness campaigns, um, health workers or citizens use community app to report infections, breeding sites, increase in mosquitoes, and other related concerns. Muscat makes data available to all stakeholders like citizens, governments, pest management companies, and hospitals for better coordination and transparency. Muscat supports GTS recommended three pillar strategy pro providing prevention strategies based on vector control, targeting vectors and parasites in transmission and interventions trigger, triggered by surveillance data. Vector control is implemented on the, base of, on the basis of local entomological and epidemiological data 
ensuring equitable access to quality services. Data related to mega trends like deforestation, urbanization, land use, natural disasters, water body levels are collected autonomously using satellite data. Muskets platform helps to lower disease burden by increasing the coverage with effective in interventions by allowing local governments or communities to make data-driven targeted actions. As new innovations in vector control, testing and, drugging, and drugs are introduced, Muskate data platform will provide deep insights monitoring the effectiveness of these innovations and improve the coverage, ensuring equitable access. Muskate platform is scalable and adaptable to new variables that might arise in the future. In spite of numerous challenges we face, we are also in really, really exciting times to take advantage of the powerful technologies like artificial intelligence and sensors to disrupt the status quo and march towards achieving our goals set in GTS. Muskit is already active in five cities in India and see the potential to deploy uh, globally. Muskit is also listed in the Digital X catalog published by the United Nations Development Program. Thank you all for your time. Thank you so much, Sadish. This is great news um, for the malaria community. I think what will be helpful is um, maybe post the events, if you can have um, send a video or something to actually showcase what you just talked about. I yeah. think it would be helpful. Yeah, we can share with uh, uh, the audience. Sure, I know. Today. Yeah, great. Thank you. Um, to our next speaker, um, Avery from USAID. Um, similarly to what I've asked um, Dr. Corinna Pepeshwal as a donor, a very important donor in the malaria community, what is your, from your perspective, what has worked, what hasn't worked, and what should we change to achieve the GTS goal? Over to you, Avery. Thank you, and thank you for the opportunity to join today to discuss what the global community needs to do to achieve the global technical strategies, goals around malaria control and elimination. PMI's uh, 2021 to 2026 strategy and Malaria Faster, which aligns quite closely with a global technical strategy, was developed with that very question in mind. In developing the strategy, we looked to PMI's experience to consider what's worked in the fight against malaria, what hasn't, and how do we need to adjust to achieve those goals. Our new strategy shifts away from a one-size-fits-all approach to a more tailored approach that meets countries where they are in their journey to end malaria and reflects on what is working in a given context and what might need to change to bring us closer to achieving our malaria control and elimination goals. The strategy has three main objectives. Two are about the burden, or two are about burden reduction for cases and deaths. And the third focus is on helping countries stay on track for elimination. The objectives are reduce malaria mortality by 33% and malaria morbidity by 40% from 2015 levels in high burden PMI partner countries and bring at least 10 PMI partner countries towards national or subnational elimination of malaria and assist at least one country in the greater Mekong subregion to eliminate malaria. To accomplish this and the strategies reflected in the global technical strategy, or the goals reflected in the global technical strategy, there's really key five key focus areas that PMI is focusing on. Reaching the unreach. So PMI is working to make sure everyone at risk has access to the critical tools and medicines they need by bringing care to people where they live. The second is strengthening community health systems by investing in training, supervising, and equipping health workers at health facilities and in communities, PMI really aims to transform and extend community and frontline systems to end malaria and improve the quality and reach of primary and frontline health services. The third is around keeping malaria services resilient. PMI is adapting malaria services to respond and stay resilient despite ever-evolving complex and widespread challenges, including COVID-19, drug and insecticide resistance, Anopheles Stevens eye, climate change, and conflict. The fourth focuses on investing locally. Local communities know best the challenges they face fighting malaria 
and what they need to beat the disease. PMI is deliberately working to shift more leadership, decision-making, and implementation to local partners to ensure sustainable, effective, and equitable malaria services and stronger health systems over time. And the fifth is around innovating and leading. The key to driving towards malaria elimination is constant innovation and optimizing the use of existing tools to extend the reach and impact of malaria services in diverse environments. I'd like to take a moment to share a couple practical examples of each focus area to demonstrate how this is being oper operationalized on the ground. To reach the unreached, PMI is invested in increasing and expanding access to care. For example, PMI trained more than 1,000 private sector pharmacy assistants in remote communities in Nigeria on how to test for malaria, treat uncomplicated cases, and refer more severe cases to health facilities, expanding the reach of malaria services to communities that were previously lacking critical care. To strengthen frontline health systems, PMI is integrating malaria care with other critical health services. In Guinea, for example, during the distribution of medicines to prevent malaria, children and pregnant women were caught up on missed routine vaccinations for diseases such as yellow fever, diphtheria, and tetanus. To keep malaria services resilient, PMI is working to combat the threat of drug and insecticide resistance. PMI is helping labs and partner countries develop their skills to monitor for anti-malarial resistance by transitioning and expanding to a model where malaria endemic countries will increasingly implement molecular testing independently and train African laboratory scientists in regional labs. To invest locally, PMI is supporting the scale up of regional manufacturing by adjusting our procurement policies and leveraging procurement volume to ensure a large share of our purchases of medicines are made in Africa. PMI has agreements with two African pharmaceutical manufacturers to procure anti-malarial treatments and 30% of PMI's 2023 standard net procurements are being sourced from African-based manufacturers. To innovate and lead, PMI is leading the global response to Anopheles Stevens Eye. PMI supported surveillance conducted in Ethiopia is being shared with the global community to allow for the early detection and rapid response of the mosquito in new locations. And PMI training on malaria collection and analysis is strengthening the region's capacity to distinguish Anopheles Stevens Eye from other mosquitoes. The focus areas outlined in PMI's 2021 to 2026 strategy are intended to address the wide range of challenges and threats facing malaria control and elimination efforts globally. Increasing our investments in these areas will be an important step toward achieving the goals in the global technical strategy. Equally important though, will be increasing, and we've heard a little bit of this already, the pool of funding able to support such efforts. With government and donor budgets shrinking, COVID impacts lingering, conflicts and climate crisis increasing, and continued population growth. The cost of doing business has increased, and it's a critically important to ensure increased resources for the fight to end malaria globally. Thanks. Thank you, Avery, um, for sharing with us your robust strategy that is really, really tailored, yes, tailored to meet our current needs and challenges. Um, we hope that we will be able to work on this and scale it up so, yeah, as, as much as possible. Thank you. Um, and then to our next um, speaker, um, Patrick says from Vestergaard, Patrick, WHO recently published recommendations on two new types of ITN, including issuing a pre-qualification for the manufacturing um, permanent dwell nets. How will this play out in the wake of the rising biological threats? What can be done to make these dual active nets more available to those who need them? Because it's beyond just making it, um, um, getting it recommended. Access is very important as to what we've been talking about. So how do we get it out there? Over to you, 
um, Patrick. In, indeed, thank you so much. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Thank you so much for the invitation to participate in CAMA GBC Health's World Malaria Day webinar on such a distinguished panel. I almost set my calendar every year for this webinar. Um, so thank you for having me back again. The first and probably the most important note uh, to, to, to make here is that 619,000 people uh, died from, from malaria last year uh, from what is a preventable and entirely curable disease. And this increase in, in, in both deaths and cases this close to the 2030 targets is a sobering concern. And this keeps me awake at night as I know that we have uh, good tools and interventions that when supported by long-term efficacy data and deployed in a timely manner can indeed bring down the burden of disease. So Vestergaard has uh, both the scale, the, the capacity, and, and not least the performance uh, record, the performance track record to ensure that high quality, long lasting bed nets can be made available at a moment's notice. And we've heard several times today, insecticide resistance. Um, insecticide resistance in malaria mosquitoes is now well established, it's widespread and it's increasing. And along with artemisinin uh, resistance and the spread of Anopheles stevensi, it is indeed one of the most concerning biological threats and one that could derail malaria control and elimination efforts. But it is important to state that current long-lasting nets, uh, particularly the PBO long-lasting nets that present with long-term efficacy data are indeed still efficacious and do provide an excellent cost-effective solution in, in reducing malaria mortality rates. However, this rapid spread and of course the intensity of insecticide resistance to the current recommended uh, insecticide classes used in vector control uh, tools really does require us to continuously identify and develop new insecticides and LLINs for public health. And so, yes, the WHO uh, pre-qualification did indeed publish a strong recommendation for the deployment of a new type of mosquito net, a pyrethroid chlorphenopyr net, that has been demonstrated to reduce malaria cases by nearly 50% in two randomized control trials. Furthermore, semi-field studies conducted by researchers in numerous uh, countries across Sub-Saharan Africa demonstrate permanent duals consistent superior efficacy against pyrethroid resistant mosquitoes. Now combining two active ingredients, deltamethrin as a pyrethroid and chlorphenopyr as a pyrrole enhances the ability of permanent dual to kill increasingly resistant malaria mosquitoes, but it also helps to decrease the likelihood that mosquitoes become resistant to both active ingredients. We are, of course, uh, delighted that permanent dual, our first dual active ingredient net, has been pre qualified by WHO. This makes Vestergaard the first company with a fully comprehensive uh, portfolio of long lasting insecticidal nets for the prevention of malaria. Now, the, the, the recommendation, I think, is important to note. Uh, because we've been talking really about uh, quality and, and, and data, the, the recommendation considers that compared to pyrethroid only nets or pyrethroid PBO nets, the new dual active ingredient uh, pyrethroid uh, chlorphenopyr nets should have an increased killing effect against pyrethroid resistant malaria vectors, and of course, therefore, a greater impact against malaria. And so the conclusion of the, uh, of the, of the WHO pre-qualification is actually based on the assessment of safety, quality, and efficacy of permanent dual, and provides guidance to uh, United Nations agencies, uh, donors, WHO member states in their procurement decisions, but it further supports acceleration in the shift to more effective nets. And so countries can now express their needs for dual active ingredient nets from their funding partners. Now, apart from the resource constraints that I fear may persist, 
we have three obvious areas uh, to strengthen. Number, number one is the speed of, of rollout of, of innovations. So the demand for dual active ingredient uh, LLINs is very high. And when faced with funding constraints, procurement commitments and adoption at scale are essential to support the rollout of the most effective tools currently available. And so given its production capacity and decades of experience supporting mass campaigns in Sub-Saharan Africa, Vestergaard is in a unique position to produce permanent dual at scale. And so the second point is the quality of real-time data advising uh, procurement decisions. And I believe we've heard this several times today. Insecticide resistance and its underlying mechanisms are well documented. We understand what the problem is. And so we need to apply this data to procurement decisions and support extensive monitoring and surveillance, something we've also heard. And so we need better and more granular data and we need the science to guide us in terms of which are the most efficacious tools to deploy. But it's really also this point that Satish made about access to real-time data. And so forgive me for a moment, but the World Malaria Report, which is a criti critically important annual report that helps us to assess, of course, the strategies, the tools, the investments and the interventions, but it's really a look in the rear view mirror. And so it becomes extremely difficult to fight a disease if the data that you're basing decisions off of are already several months old. And then there's um, a slightly controversial point around systematic inefficiencies. And, and I really do think that we should continuously look for ways to better optimize the way we fight malaria. We have to be bold enough to ask the question, are we fully optimized to invest every dollar, entertain every new partnership, deliver every commodity, and measure every success or failure? And so given the excitement around WHO's strong recommendation for the deployment of new pyrethroid for net, my message is very, very clear. We are scaling up as rapidly as our quality assurance allows, and we welcome the opportunity, of course, to supply permanent dual as fast as countries can express those needs. If we want to bring innovation to market fast, we need strategic partnerships. And I strongly believe that only if key institutions and the private sector can work hand in hand, will we be, will we be able to unlock our full potential and move closer to a world free of malaria. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Patrick. You've made some very good salient points on how we can actually move us, move the needle forward from where we are to where we want to get to. You use the word optimize several times, which is very key um, to um, in, in the fight against malaria. So uh, before I move into the next phase of questions, we have tons of questions already from the participants prior to the meeting. Um, before we move to take those questions, um, for those that are online at the moment, if you have questions, please feel free to put it on the chat box and we will take your questions as they come in. Um, yeah, so it's 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 been great um, hearing from these speakers so far. Um, and like I said, there's so much interest in this conversation. So I will just move over to the next phase of questions. I'll start with Dr. Perpetual. Um, Dr. Perpetual, I'll take two questions at, at a go. First, what is the NMEP doing to strengthen states at, that are, are being less donor dependent? Um, states, out, what is what is the what are you doing currently to strengthen those states and to ensure that they are not donor dependent? Um, then, secondly, um, what is the role of country programs in deciding appropriate interventions? And this make a difference in achieving the goal of the GTS? So those are the two questions for you now. Over, Dr. Okay. Professor. All right, thank you, Ochuku. And uh, yeah, yeah, very interesting uh, uh, insight from the different speakers so far. Uh, for us in Nigeria, how are we strengthening the state to become less donor dependent? Uh, we are more and more uh, promoting uh, domestic resource mobilization, both at the national level and at the state level. 
So NMEP has recently developed a public-private sector partnership document, a strategy document, and also a resource mobilization plan uh, for the country, which will guide both the national and the state level um, uh, implementers to be able to mobilize domestic resources. Like you mentioned earlier, there's a rich private sector uh, uh, set up in Nigeria, and the states can, can uh, you know, work with this, collaborate and engage with them properly to get uh, funding. May not necessarily be as philanthropic funding, but even in terms of investment in malaria, looking at it as a business case, you know, a healthy workforce, you know, within their, their, their operational communities within the state. Is it not, is it, wouldn't it be good for them to invest in malaria so they have more workers, you know, we know that we know the huge number of uh, of, of um, resources that are lost each year to malaria treatments at the state level, absenteeism from work, you know, and from schools, and then the, the parents, caregivers, so children who are having four or five episodes of malaria each year, and not to talk of the the strain on their on on their uh, um, uh, fluid uh, on their funds because we know that Nigerians presently. Uh, spend over 70% of the funding for malaria is out of pocket expenditure. So, um, so when we, so so that translates to you know some level of of uh, of poverty among the population. So if we then the private sector invest in malaria as a business case, you know even if in terms of the the new tools development of new tools, whether it's for diagnosis or treatment or prevention, or even to 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 invest in IRS, like look at that's what's being done in Ghana. You know, the government is funding IRS, but it's also a, a private sector at the mining company that are also uh, funding IRS to, to complement what the government is funding. So we, we want the states to, to look inward, you know, look for how they can mobilize resources within their states, or, uh, whether from the private sector or even with, with more budgetary allocation from government so that they will be able to be, 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 become less and less dependent on uh, a senate donor funding because we all know and it's a reality that there's dwindling donor support you know from outside and and it's a reality we all have to face so we begin we need to look more and more inwards you know to make sure that there's sustainability in terms of funding uh, for malaria within the government of course we know about the basic health care provision fund that the federal government has a system for primary health care. Of course, malaria is a component of that, you know, so, so that is one percent, at least one percent of the consolidated budget from the government is going to, to primary health care, strengthening of primary health care and provision of services within the primary health care. And Nigeria is one of the package of, uh, miss, excuse me, malaria is one of the package of intervention that is being provided within that post. So, uh, uh, so those are some of the ways they can do. Of course, there's also the issue around social uh, investments and um, uh, health insurance, you know, at the state level, so that people spend less on uh, out-of-pocket uh, expenditure for malaria, rather depend on um, health insurance to sustain uh, some of those uh, funding uh, for malaria. So that that's what we are encouraging states to do uh, within that. Sorry, I didn't get the second question. Okay, the second question, please. Um, let's let's keep our responses short so we can. We have tons of questions. I just want to go to go through as, as much as possible. Um, the second question is: What is the role um, of country programs in deciding appropriate interventions? Can this make a difference in achieving the GTS goal? Yeah. So we we uh, we of course we we have highlighted a, a package of intervention. Like I said, when we do the sub national tailoring, look uh, at the uh, local government level. Of what works well no, and no longer and uh, moving away from the one one cap fits all approach. Yeah. So uh, so we've done that at each local government uh, level, but most of those interventions now are still implemented at uh, at the state level. For for instance, the ITN campaign, but the SMC is actually at the local government level to identify the target local government that are eligible. But the net campaigns are still done at the state level. So uh, so the national program working with uh, our technical partners. All you know, we develop the malaria strategy for the country, and based on this, we we, we determine what are the appropriate interventions that will work where. Because we recognize that there's 
heterogeneity in malaria transmission in Nigeria. So you have state like Lagos where you have less than 2% prevalence, to state like KB where you have over 45% prevalence. So you cannot deploy the same interventions to those uh, in, in those scenarios. So we, we, we always uh, review this. We are about to embark on a malaria, uh, a midterm review of our strategic plan this year uh, so that we know what has worked so far, what has not worked, why it did not work it. We have states that we continue to have high transmission despite uh, uh, continuous ITN campaigns and the SMC and all that. So we are, you know, looking, using uh, operations research to determine why is this happening? Why, why, why are things not working? And uh, what can we do differently in such scenarios? So, uh, and then of course, there's the issue around the, the other third of the country that are not implementing seasonal malaria tumor prevention. What then do we deploy there? Like perennial malaria transmission and all that. So we do use our programs, working with the state level uh, people. We continue to update our policies and documents and, uh, and guidelines to, to inform the states in terms of deployment of interventions based on, code on what is available at the global level uh, within with the uh, guidance from WHO. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you, Mal, for your response. Um, to our next, next speaker, Dr. Corey, um, I have two questions for you as well. I'll just merge them in one. Um, first is, what needs to be done by countries that are economically struggling and are faced with a heavy malaria burden? And yet partners funding is landscape for malaria is dwindling, as we already know. That's one question. What needs to be done for countries that are at that, at those, at that level? And then secondly, we've talked about, you, you mentioned it in your opening speech, um, about enhancing core malaria co um, interventions is very key. In addition to innovate, innovating new products, we need to ensure that the current products are very effective. So what are top three practical ways that we can enhance the current tools that are in existence? And then the first question I just posed, over. Thank you, Oshuko. So uh, I'm, I'm going to really respond quickly since uh, we need to, to also have uh, to respond to the other question. So for the first one, what needs to be done uh, by countries? Uh, for me, I think that uh, our number one is to get political attention for a priority public health problem uh, that's predominantly impact on marginalized population. So this is really uh, very important. The second one is uh, there is a need to build active civil society that calls for political leaders so that they can translate their political commitment into money and action for us to really uh, increase domestic funding. And then of course, uh, the third one is that it's important that we demonstrate the benefit from investments. So both have social and economic. And then uh, the fourth one is integration. It's really important that uh, if countries are able to integrate services, are able to integrate uh, all the mechanisms for distribution, for provision of health services, as well as uh, provision of and deployment of all malaria control intervention with efficiency, uh, we, 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 we can also help to, to really uh, uh, address uh, this uh, funding gap. And then the, 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 the other one is to tackle the broader de the, the, the determinant uh, of uh, the disease. So now when you, you say what are the practical um, you, you, the, the, the other question was that the yeah two three practical ways we can enhance core malaria interventions existing interventions so uh you number one is uh first of all when we look at the world malaria uh, uh report the 2022 it's really recognized that too many people are still missing out of the intervention and then the quality of services uh they need so there is a poor quality of care. And uh, this is compromising the benefit of all the interventions. So for instance, when you look at uh, the rectal artesanate, we are not able to, 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 to deliver, to deploy that because there is an issue of health uh, system, a weak health system. So the successfully uh, delivery of all intervention rely on a very important and motivated uh, uh, healthcare workers. And of course, this includes community health workers. So in all settings, uh, it's really important that um, we, 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 we strengthen and then 
and make sure that we have a resilient health system that can deliver the quality malaria uh, services and also that are able to withstand disruptive uh, events like uh, what we had with the COVID pandemic. So the health system had a clear orientated through, towards uh, primary health care. It's really important because we know that primary health care is the backbone of successful response to malaria. And then more of more of the more of the 90% of essential health, health services can be delivered through uh, primary health care. So it's really important that uh, we we really uh, improve and uh, our primary health care. And then the third one, I think it's the most important. And as uh, Ivory said, we need to engage communities in the response. As she said, they have great insight and the experiment, experiential knowledge. So we really need uh, to, to engage that, uh, them. So for me, the three uh, practical ways for us to improve um, uh, the, the coverage of the malaria uh, control intervention. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Corinne. Um, Avery, I have two questions for you as well. Um, the first is, um, do you think the future of malaria should focus more on prevention or treatment or a combination? And then the second question is, how can we unlock funding for malaria impl implementation? We need more funding, obviously. How do we go about it? Sure, yeah, happy to answer those questions and, and thank you. Um, so to the first question on sort of the future of malaria and, and what's needed, whether it's prevention or treatment or both, I mean, I think it goes without saying that both are incredibly important. Um, but I would emphasize, I think we've learned a lot over the past several years, especially sort of seeing how the community has responded um, to the COVID pandemic, the importance of, of prevention efforts. Um, I think I might be showing a little personal bias here, but coming from a background also of social and behavior change, um, I think a key component of those prevention efforts and one sometimes that is not focused on enough um, is how human behavior uh, impacts and influences the uptake of our key prevention interventions. So how do we ensure that we are empowering communities, families, and individuals to keep themselves safe from malaria? Um, and recognize this is, this is really nuanced, but um, as Dr. Perpetua noted earlier, the funding for our work around human behavior in social and behavior change interventions tends to get cut quite early um, especially as there's an increasingly tight funding envelope. And so pushing to ensure SBC is part of that preve prevention package that it's prioritized um, so that we are able to really see the full impact of key prevention interventions and make sure that it's maximized. I think that's critically important and also a really great place for private sector collaboration. I think through PMI, we've seen a number of successful models of where private sector collaboration makes sense in the SBC space. Um, many of our PMI countries are working with telecom companies and others to expand the reach of some of their, their behavior change interventions. And I think those are laudable efforts and ones that should continue um, to be built upon. Um, to the to the second question, I think it's a hard one, um, but a critically important one around sort of how we unlock funding for implementation. Um, I mean, I think we all know that we're sort of at this critical point in the fight against malaria um, with this notable funding shortfall um, in that fight. I think it's obvious that not a single organization, donor, country, is gonna be able to single-handedly close that gap. Um, and so it's gonna require innovative ways to finance the fight. And I think for the purpose of this, I think one thing to really emphasize is the need for renewed and expanded partnerships with our private sector colleagues. Um, I think, you know, so accelerating and expanding partnerships with the private sector has been a priority at USAID, which is the lead agency for PMI. 
um, the agency is really undergoing a, an intentional shift towards pursuing market-based approaches and investments as a more sustainable way to address development challenges. And I think the, the malaria community is an important part of that in finding those ways to better and more fully engage with private sector partnerships. I think a nice example of what we've seen in recent years is really developing uh, the, the collaboration and partnerships across multiple sectors that we've seen through N Malaria Councils. In Zambia, for instance, the, the sort of innovative N Malaria Council is a great opportunity where we're able to convene those senior government, business, and community leaders to really mobilize resources and keep malaria elimination, malaria control high on the public and private sector agendas. I will say though, I think just a point and a point from our strategy as well that's important, as we look towards continuing to expand those partnerships with the private sector, equally important to be making sure that as a global community, we are directing more resources towards local organizations and prioritizing local ownership. Mm -hmm. I think for PMI, um, ensuring that is fundamental to ensuring the sustainability of these efforts and it's been encouraging to see country-led and country-owned initiatives um, already, but important to make sure that's an important nuance to how we're expanding and building on private sector collaboration, which I think will be a key part of unlocking those additional resources for implementation. Thanks. Thank you so much, Avery. Um, our next question will go to Patrick. Um, Patrick, two questions as well for you. And what are the prospects of expanding the vector control toolbox to help achieve the GTS goal? And secondly, how do we address the issue of non-compliance of providing quality, durable LLINs that can last for three years or more? Over to you, Patrick. Thank you so much. Um, two fantastic questions. Um, it's been said several times uh, today, we have to move away from a one size fits all approach um, and, and really uh, look at the data. Um, but we also need, and I'm going to do this very quick because I'm cognizant of time. We've heard so much about partnerships and collaborations, and I'm, I'm, I'm very grateful for hearing this because I uh, remember sitting on a panel uh, yeah, in Washington, D.C. a number of years ago where I sort of used the word radical partnerships and, and, and I'm kind of really yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm hearing such an interest, such a, such a need to, to, to move that forward and really find ways and find new pathways to bringing innovative tools uh, to malaria endemic countries. It is absolutely imperative. And the pathways are now established through WHO BQ, as we have now seen uh, with, the, with, the, with the new category. But I'd really like to sort of address that second question. And, and so the three parts, I'm kind of thinking to this answer. And, and, and number one is, uh, and I'll expand a little bit, uh, responsibility and accountability. Uh, number two would be post-market surveillance. And number three, not all bed nets are equal. So if we talk about responsibility and accountability, manufacturers have a responsibility to deliver quality nets. And this is a given. And, but we also have to acknowledge that donors funding the nets, buyers procuring them, and endemic countries deploying them all need to play their part to hold manufacturers accountable to deliver nets that actually meet quality requirements. So accountability is about responsibility, holding each other responsible to achieve our common goal of eliminating malaria. So I think I'd really like to put that one aside. So that's accountability and responsibility. The second point is really that, that data point, right? Post-market surveillance, we support uh, uh, the assessment that there is a need for much stronger and more comprehensive testing and sampling of bed nets. And we have actually, if you will remember Ruchuko in a previous webinar with Camera and GBC Health, evidenced the need for a systematic routine post-market surveillance system, an end-to-end -end monitoring or quality monitoring framework. Now, such a framework does not only ensure that quality assured products reach the population, but it also ensures that those products continue to perform um, in, in, uh, in, as in, over the lifetime of the net, as intended over the lifetime of the net is what I wanted to say. 
And so I really also believe that country regulatory frameworks can play a vital role in its adoption. And I think it's a, 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 a tremendous opportunity to actually applaud Nigeria and in particular, uh, uh, Dr. Perpetua for championing Nigeria as the first country to implement a nationally coordinated post-market surveillance strategy. And I'd like to believe that it wasn't easy. Um, but given that Nigeria has a population of over 200 million people, and that since 2009 uh, has distributed over 200 million nets, there is of course an urgent need to understand how these nets are performing in reducing malaria burden in Nigeria. And so there's that third point, not all LLINs are equal. And so when we talk about durability, we have to acknowledge that it's a function of uh, long lasting bioefficacy. It is the polymer material, it's the physical integrity, it's uh, bursting strength, uh, bioavailability of the active ingredient. So we recognize that there may not be enough empirical data out there on which to conclude that one material is, is more durable than another. And so net durability is, is a very important factor in the long-term efficacy of LLINs. And so we know that LLINs will naturally deteriorate uh, and, and that users are more likely to stop using and, and may discard or repurpose a, a net. And we've certainly that heard about the behavior, the human behavior uptake of interventions. However, several studies actually provide evidence and conclude that there may be, in fact, significant variances between materials. So recent comparative data, if I remember correctly, from Burkina Faso, uh, Rwanda, and Sierra Leone, just to name a few, evidence that the estimated median survival of, for example, a permanent 3.0 at 24 months is three years. In some cases, it's above three years, and in other cases, it's slightly below at 2.9 years. And it was also noted that between um, 84 and 93% of nets at two years were still in a good serviceable condition. So I think we have to be very careful when we say nets in general. Bed nets are the most cost-effective tool that we have in the fight against uh, malaria. We know they're responsible for averting up to 70% of malaria cases, and they're instrumental in the success of the WHO 2030 malaria targets. So to ensure that the global community can meet these goals, it is of course essential uh, to, to, uh, to, to defend sort of the quality of an LLIN. Thank you, Patrick. I couldn't agree with you more on those points you just made. Um, next two questions, um, we'll go to Satish. Satish, um, given the high resistance we're currently experiencing, what is the immediate practical role of technology in coping this menace? And then secondly, um, how can we unlock funding to invest in innovation and technology? Right. So um, coming to the first question on the resistance, the way um, we identify the resistance primarily from a vector standpoint, right, is uh, once these this sensors or the traps that are with the sensors are placed around, and uh, as we are collecting the data, we also collect the data on what kind of interventions are done in that area, right? We also recommend the interventions. At the same time, um, the, the ground or the field staff have an opportunity to update um, saying that this is the intervention done, the date, the time, um, what kind of pesticide used, and so on. Right. So as we collect data over several months, that will help us to determine um, based on the benchmarking if there is already a prevalent uh, pesticide resistance in uh, for that particular pesticide. So that is the approach we're taking purely based on uh, the data, which also comes in in uh, uh, from the sensors collecting data and then the inputs coming from the field personnel on what pesticides are applied in that particular area. So uh, that is the uh, that is I think um, yeah and, and again based on uh, that it helps us to understand um, from a locational uh, from a location context or a local context uh, what is happening in that particular area uh, you know all uh, some some areas might have resistance to certain pesticides some might not have to certain pesticides so understanding all those aspects of it is what we bring in with the data and making the suggestions to either the local governments or communities on 
on um, going through some of the approaches that the WHO is recommending on mixing those pesticides and things like that, right? So that is uh, that is where we are coming up with uh, with the data. And uh, coming to the next question on on the funding aspect, and again, this is purely coming from our perspective, you know, which is a startup perspective on how uh, to uh, help uh, in you know startups who are doing this innovation in this space. Um, so these are the points, and and I see that as two aspects. One is um, you know investments, and the other one is making our solution part of a program, which obviously helps us to do more research and become more sustainable. Um, so a uh, couple of things here. One is uh, making the stakeholders like the governments, the donors, or, or the NGOs understand the importance of the innovation to change the status quo. And I'd like to share an experience where a nonprofit, um, just comparing the immediate benefit of distributing malaria kits versus spending on innovation. And again, I understand why that comparison is done, but I think uh, because in the innovation, the results might come over time and we need a vision to do it, right? And um, so for that reason, setting aside uh, a percentage of the funds to integrate these new innovations in the current programs, I think that would really uh, benefit the innovators. And then increasing the awareness of the complex play of several variables and their role in effective interventions. Um, you know, even though we say that surveillance is a key pillar, um, when we deal with, for example, a city government in um, our, our team in India, they questioned the need of surveillance data. When we try to explain, they pushed back saying they have surveillance data, which, which was done like five years back. So, you know, that awareness is very key. Then validation of certification from the core agencies like, you know, World Health Organization, that will really help us to uh, onboard more customers and, and raising uh, private investments too. Uh, for instance, Muscat, we got validation from UNDP, but I think World Health Organization would make uh, better sense. Uh, increasing pub uh, public and private sectors and NGOs to host competitions and challenges to support innovations, where they will call for the innovations, they will uh, review them and then highlight one or two and then fund them you know, for, the, for, for that to grow. And then assigned contracts or letter of intents, either from governments or, or NGOs or the donors, um, so that will help the innovators to raise funds in the private from the private investors. And then one of the critical things I've uh, come to understand is the mindset in the VCs is that the mosquito bond disease space should be funded by governments or the NGOs. So there is the incorrect assumption that the solutions are not commercially viable. Um, I totally disagree on that. For instance, there is a lot of spending in the private commercial and residential secret, uh, sectors on mosquito control, including in US, right? Uh, this sector is fragmented and does not rely on any kind of surveillance data. They just go and spray and come, you know. So there's a huge opportunity to organize these sectors with the data platforms like us. So there is a huge opportunity for us to be really, really, uh, you know, um, commercially viable. But you know, just because we're in this space, the VCs just put a wall in front of us, you know. Um, and then there might be some some PMI, you know, for example, some NGOs or governments who, who or, or donors who might not have a fund, but they could provide assistance by local teams uh, just to support the innovation. Uh, so these are the things that again, these are all purely from our perspective. Um, so <laughs> hopefully that makes sense. Thank you. Thank you, Satish. I know we are time. And before we take uh, the closing remark, um, I would want to take one more question because we have so many questions on this issue. I would love Dr. Corey to shed some light on the R21 um, vaccine that has just been recommended, um, uh, approved and recommended um, as that is being adopted by some countries, Ghana, for example, and then Nigeria. It's a shame that Dr. Perpetual is no longer on the call. I would have asked a similar question. But um, I just wanted to, what are the expectations of the RBM on this newly approved malaria vaccine? Just a few, one, two minutes, please. Thank you. You're muted, Dr. Corinne, we can hear you. Sorry. <laughs> Great. So sorry. So um, for the what is very important to 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 know it's um, 
the R21 malaria vaccine, it's the second. Uh, so first of all, there is only one uh, WHO approved vaccine, which okay. is the RTSS that have been uh, implemented and is being implemented uh, in three countries, uh, Kenya, Ghana, and Malawi, and which have shown uh, some uh, successful uh, results. But what is uh, it's, it's very important is uh, Ghana, uh, as well as um, Nigeria also, yeah. uh, have, have approved the new malaria vaccine. Of course, this is the malaria vaccine that is still undergoing studies. It's not yet approved by WHO because there is uh, many steps that uh, has to be done before a vaccine or an insecticide or any malaria intervention tools uh, needs to, to pass through many phases of mm -hmm. trials and have, show impact or efficacy for for, for the, the WHO to, to sit and then look at all the results and see if um, a, a product is not harmful, if the efficacy is really very uh, at a level where it will have impact and uh, be uh, used and uh, have partners to, to invest uh, in that. So this is uh, number one. Number two, what is very important is um, uh, as you know, the R21 uh, matrix M vaccine, it's a, a vaccine that is developed by the University of Oxford. And uh, the early reports, especially when you look at all the early uh, phase of trials, they've shown that the vaccine could have uh, a significant impact uh, because when you see the last, uh, recently it's the phase two data that was published uh, in, I think it was in September, which have shown that there is high effectiveness uh, uh, following the fourth dose, uh, booster dose. But what is important is um, the, the, the vaccine is still undergoing other studies. So uh, of course a country, uh, especially when you look at Ghana, Ghana has a very good regulatory uh, system as well as strong regulatory system they can approve a vaccine, but that will be a vaccine that will only be used uh, uh, by the country, but it's not yet uh, approved by WHO. So those are maybe uh, the two elements that I should maybe uh, say about the, the vaccine. So the vaccine has shown uh, great results mm -hmm. when you look at the early phase, especially the phase two data that were uh, published in September. But what is important is the vaccine is not yet approved by WHO. It has been approved by uh, Ghana. And of course, uh, any country can uh, decide what is good for the population. But it's important that uh, we all follow uh, WHO uh, processes as well as mandates because WHO is there for mm -hmm. us, the guarantee of all the, 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 the tools that we are using in the health sector. Thank you, Dr. Curran, for that clarification and information and update on the RT1. RT1 is very important. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, once again, I want to say thank you to all our speakers and participants um, for the tremendous contribution to, to this event. I believe that what we've heard today and what we've learned in this event will help us shape the global malaria discourse and ultimately veer us, hopefully veer us in the right direction to attain the goal to end malaria in our generation. It is possible. As change makers that we are, we're not just talk talkers, as change makers that we are, we, we hope that we'll put our words to action. Beyond today's discussion, it is what we do as, as a community, as you know, that, that really matters when we leave this room. So let, let's try to get out there and do what we said we're gonna do and even, you know, scale more. And so to give us a closing, um, closing remark, I want to welcome Tawhida Zayed. Um, she's an advisor, uh, government and business relations at ExxonMobil. So uh, over to you. Um, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, everybody. We've listened attentively to the, all the remarks made by the amazing speakers, I might say. 
and as expected from a GBS and CAMA event, the quality and depth of the discussion has been rich and inspiring. Thank you for that. Necessary conversations like this, where tough questions, they shift minds, enable progress and drive practical action in the fight to end malaria need to take place more often. The need for stakeholders to understand the issues, the gaps, the innovative solutions available and how contributions can be harnessed to produce consolidated and strategic impact cannot be emphasized. I feel that this was achieved at this webinar. As each speaker spoke, it was amazing the amount of information available out there, the, the, the potential available if all stakeholders could come on board and work as a team. We thank CAMA for setting up this webinar and also for all the stakeholders who made time out of their busy schedules to take part in this discussion. Thank you for being part of the fight to eliminate malaria. And as OC always emphasizes, it needs a collective effort, all hands on deck, and it is possible, as Dr. Karima said, to eliminate malaria. Thank you once again. Thank you, Tua, for wrapping it up in a beautiful way with a ball on top. Partnership, collaboration, we can't emphasize that enough. No one sector can do it alone. We can't do it alone. The private sector cannot do it alone. Governments, um, donors, multilateral agency, we all need to come together, the NGOs, come together and ensure that we bring malaria to an end. It is possible. It's going to be done in our time. Thank you all and enjoy the rest of your day. Bye for now. Thank you. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Mm -hmm.